Thank you, everybody, uh, and welcome to our conversation um, this afternoon on the capital markets developments in East Africa. Today, I have the privilege and honor of being joined by um, representations from uh, the East African community, uh, including Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. I have the honor uh, of introducing to yourselves uh, Dr. Adam Mugume, who is the uh, executive uh, uh, research in, in Bank of Uganda. I'm also joined by Hilda Njeru, who is the head of legal and compliance at the Central Depository and Settlement Corporation in Kenya. Um, and we'll be later joined uh, by Mr. Muremi Mara, who is the chief executive officer of the Dar es Salaam Stock Exchange PLC. Last but not least, uh, we are joined by Mr. Kam Kuria Kamau, uh, who is the regional economist for East Africa for Stanbic Bank, uh, representing the three countries. So, Karibuni Sana. So, our focus really is on the capital market development um, in East Africa. And to kick us off, we will have a macroeconomic uh, overview uh, led by Bwana Kuria Kamau will speak to us on what we've seen in terms of GDP growth, uh, inflation, interest rates, uh, and currency, and overlaying that on the um, COVID-19 and the impact that it has had in our region. Thank you. Karibu. Uh, thanks, Janet. Um, and a pleasure to meet you all, um, albeit virtually. Uh, so let's kick it off with Kenya. I'll take us through the three countries across East Africa. Let's kick it off with Kenya. And uh, these days you can't start a discussion on uh, the economy without discussing COVID-19 and where we are. You probably remember in Q1, uh, the Kenyan economy grew by 5%. That was pre-COVID. Uh, uh, Q2 numbers came out a few weeks ago. Um, in essence, the, the, the economy contracted by 6%, 5.7% to be exact. Uh, which was largely driven by, as you can expect, uh, hotels and restaurants during this period uh, contracted by 83%. Uh, education with kids being out of school uh, fell by around 56%. Uh, transport with a re reduced movement, uh, transport and storage fell by 12%. Also, the reduced open hours for a lot of supermarkets and stores uh, resulted in trade contracting by around 7%. Um, if we kind of look forward into Q3, um, if you look at the standard PMI, some of the leading economic indicators actually point towards a return to growth in Q3. Uh, if you also look at what the government is forecasting, the central bank is estimating around 3%, 3.1% uh, GDP growth this year. Treasury is also expected around 2.6%. Um, so, so in essence, uh, a lot of people are, are fairly uh, positive about uh, growth, a return to growth over the next coming, uh, next coming month. If I flip over to inflation, it has actually surprised on the downside over the last couple of months. Um, reasons for that has been actually lower food prices. We've had very good rainfall so far this year. And as a result, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing the benefits of that. Also, as I mentioned previously, the VAT rate is much lower this year, 14% versus 16% previously. That has had a positive impact. And also, uh, I guess a final reason, uh, the final factor that's affecting that is also the fact that you have few people in, uh, in job who have jobs uh, and limited access to credit, which in essence has resulted in muted core inflation. Uh, but that being said, I think the one area that we've seen an increase is actually on fuel prices. Uh, the reason for that actually is because the, there's a levy that uh, was increased uh, and as a result has pushed up fuel prices, which has in turn pushed up uh, transport prices. Uh, so next year, from a GDP perspective, we're actually ex estimating or expecting a recovery around uh, close to 6%, 5.9% to be exact. Um, if you look at inflation, we also think inflation will be fairly muted around 5.3% uh, next year. What does this mean for interest rates? Um, so as you can imagine, the slower growth plus the, uh, plus the lower inflation uh, points towards the, the monetary policy being uh, a, a bit more expansionary. So we expect the, the central bank to maintain the central bank rate at 7% at least towards, uh, at least for the better part of, of, of 20, 2020 and early part of 2021. Uh, if you also kind of, what does this mean uh, for, for tax revenues and also interest rates for, uh, for, for both 
uh, the private sector and also for bond investors. Uh, based on what we're seeing, we think uh, just uh, there's a lot of stimulus that was uh, COVID-19 stimulus that the government provided. And in essence, a lot of that money has found itself back uh, into the bond market, which in essence has pushed down yields. Now, if you look at where the government stands from uh, relative to borrowing targets, it's ahead of its targets, and therefore we don't expect uh, we don't expect a significant increase in uh, in, in rates at least over the next uh, six, uh, three to six months. So, if you look at the fundamentals, they actually point towards a strengthening in the Kenya shilling. Uh, so, if you look at the current account deficit, it's, uh, it's actually expected to improve uh, from around 5.8 percent to around 5.1 percent. If you look at good exports, they have been uh, in essence been flattish this year. If you look at imports, they've actually been lower. So oil is a very big import item for Kenya. Uh, and as a result of the lower international oil prices, plus reduced consumption with people working from home, that is, in essence, has resulted in, in lower uh, lower imports for us this year. Uh, one other area that has surprised is uh, remittances. They've actually grown 7% this year. Uh, the expectation across the board was that we'd see some level of con contraction, but they have been fairly resilient. Also, if you kind of look into the fourth quarter of this year, we tend to see the Kenya shilling strengthening. Um, part of the reason for that is we typically have an infrastructure bond issued around this time of the year. And what, in essence, that does it due to increased foreign uh, portfolio investor inflows into the, into the Kenyan market, we tend to see the Kenya shilling strengthen as we close out the year. Uh, so that, that being said, we are estimating, uh, we've, we're focusing the Kenya shilling will, will probably end the year closer uh, to the between the 107 108 levels then going to next year we think uh, 109 uh, 110 levels i'll quickly just highlight uh, move over to tanzania so tanzania has had a very uh, different approach to covid 19. Um, they stopped reporting daily infection numbers back in may uh, if you look at the measures they've taken there is in essence taken a uh, very few measures the only kind of two big measures they took was the temporary closure of schools as well as suspension of international flights uh, that, on the basis of that, we're we are penciling in around 4.5% GDP growth for Tanzania this year. Uh, next year, we think uh, which will be more of a recovery year. Uh, we, we, we think the economy could grow by around 7%. Uh, obviously, the, the drivers of that growth are likely to be infrastructure spending. Uh, there's a lot being done on that end, uh, but we think tourism could, could take a bit of time to recover, pro probably until we get a vaccine for COVID-19, so a, a, a bit of weakness there. I think the other thing that's important to mention uh, is the fact that um, uh, Tanzania is going to elections or it's having elections on the 28th of October. Um, there hasn't been, in essence, uh, uh, election related uncertainty um, because the incumbent is expected to win. Uh, but that being said, if you look over to the currency, the currency has been fairly stable. Um, there are two, there are in essence, three new regulations that were added uh, a few months ago. Uh, the first one was, uh, I think, there, there are several regulations that are added, but in essence, I'll just focus on three of them. Uh, the first one was that, that they reduced the amount that could be traded on the FX market uh, to $50,000 from $250,000 previously. Um, the second thing that was worth highlighting is the fact that, um, you know, the Bank of Tanzania expects that all FX transactions up to $250,000 uh, should be traded within the interbank rate, so within that range. Um, the, the third kind of important new development that we saw was the fact that commercial banks are only allowed to operate with uh, with companies that they have an operating relationship with. Um, but in essence, if you look at the, the Tanzanian shilling, um, it doesn't have a balance of payments issue. The issue has, has been largely driven by you know the, the fact that the Bank of Tanzania is not very keen um, to, to sell dollars into the market. Uh, we know they have the capability to do so. They have roughly five billion dollars in, in in reserves around, which is around six months of import cover. Um, yes, uh, I'll give you the fact that remittances have fallen significantly, around eight to eighty-five percent. Uh, but that being said, if you look at the current ac account, it's actually in a surplus. Um, you know, if you look at exports, those have been fairly resilient. S same story as Kenya. Imports have declined significantly, uh, and even you know, if, even without tourism, they're, they're still uh, managing to, to, to report a positive uh, current account uh, balance. Uh, we're looking at uh, the Tanzania shilling ending the year at around 2340. And then going to ne next year, we, we think uh, it, it could weaken slightly around, to around uh, 2370, 2360. I'll just finish it off with interest rates. Um, so inflation has been fairly muted. Uh, so, you know, 
uh, close to the four, less less than four percent actually. Um, if you look at the bu- budget deficit, it hasn't ne- necessarily widened because, in essence, what Tanzania has done as you know government revenues have been falling, they've also cut back on spending. Uh, so on, on the basis of that, we don't see a lot of pressure when, with, with regards to interest rates. Uh, so uh, you know we think the the discount rate, the Bank, Bank of Tanzania discount discount rate, could end the year at around five uh, percent. The one year uh, treasury rate we think will will probably close the year close to four four percent, four point three percent. So Uganda, if you look at the the lockdown measures, there have been a lot more stringent than uh, most of uh, most African countries. Probably one of the most stringent lockdowns that we've seen across Africa. Economic activity has also slowed quite significantly. Uh, so for the coming year, for this for this year 2020, we're expecting around 2.5% uh, growth, but we think that could recover by around 6.2% uh, next year. Um, that being said, as the government has begun easing some measures, we're, we're seeing economic activity begin to uh, improve. Uh, the government is expecting 3 to 4% uh, growth this year. The one thing that in, is, in essence, um, important to highlight out of Uganda is that Q1 next year, they have um, elections, um, which which um, shouldn't be too surprising. Uh, the incumbent is probably going to uh, win again. Uh, yeah, and, and something, so before I actually move on from, from GDP, something I think that's also worth mentioning is the fact that uh, this year we're expecting news on the FID. Um, but I, I guess considering the current environment, we haven't been able to get that. Uh, but then we've seen some positive developments. So uh, we're hoping that be, that that could come come through next year. Um, inflation is, I think, something worth mentioning. The Bank of uh, Uganda has mentioned it uh, previously as, as as being a, a bit of a concern. Uh, the reason why they're, they're seeing slightly higher inflation is just because of uh, in, imposing the new uh, the, the new regular public health restrictions. So you can imagine uh, vehicles are not allowed to have their full capacity. And as a result, the fares have, have, have in essence gone up. Um, so the government is actually expecting inflation to, to kind of peak at around 6% in Q1 next year. Um, but for us, we see it average around 4.5% uh, this year and trending close to 5% uh, going to next year. With regards to interest rates, we think the rate could remain around 7%. The key uh, benchmark rate could remain around 7%. Um, at least to, to at least for the better part of this year and, and going to uh, the early part of next year um i think there's some bias for you know based on what we're, we're seeing on, on inflation there's some bias for short-term rates to increase slightly uh but then we think if you look at mid mid medium to long-term rates those could come off uh, slightly um I, I think the final thing maybe to talk about uganda is the uganda shilling um, um it has remained fairly resilient uh, until a few year, weeks back uh, it's now around 36, 36, uh, 37, uh, and sorry, between 37, 36, and 37, 45. Uh, we think it could close there at close to close around close, uh, closer to the 38,000, uh, 38, levels, uh, which is roughly around two, two to three percent depreciation uh, over the rest of the, the year. Um, next year, we think the currency could depreciate a, a bit more, so roughly six uh, percent depreciation. I think that's more or less uh, it for me. I'll hand it back to you, Janet. So thank you, Korea, for the overview, uh, giving us highlights on the East African economy. Uh, we, we can start talking on, um, on, on Uganda. Um, uh, Korea has told us uh, what the impact of COVID-19 has had. So you can just give us a high level from a financial market what that impact has been and what the response of Bank of Uganda has been in terms of you know, managing the impact and also looking at uh, some of the interventions that have been undertaken um, to, to mitigate that. Again, really looking at how, you know, we are still, we still continue to um, ensure that, you know, we still, our, client, our investors still have confidence in, in participating in, in, our, in our market. Uh, thank you so much. I think that was an excellent brief uh, from Korea. Uganda, as we have rightly put it, uh, we had the lockdown uh, in March, and in the quarter between March and June for this uh, this calendar year, which is 2020, we had the GDP contracting by six percent. Uh, the last time we had the, a negative growth was 1985. So you can imagine what that means in the case of Uganda. I've never had the negative growth uh, since 1985. So what this transition to, because now, okay, we have easy lockdown, 
but now they also still suffer the same thing in Asia. Uh, the service sector, including hotel, tourism, travel, uh, are all affected. So we believe that in this current year, which is meant, uh, 2020, we are likely to see still a negative growth. So we are estimating currently with the minus six in quarter to June, with a growth of one percent in the first quarter of the calendar year, that's the quarter to March. It means that for this quarter we are in, which is the third quarter and the fourth, we don't see much uh, recovery compared to the minus we had in the second quarter. So we believe that by the end of the calendar year, which is by the end of December, we still have a growth of contraction, contraction of between minus 0 0.2 and minus uh, 0 0.5. However, going to 2021, that's where we see a recovery. Uh, we believe in 2021, we're likely to see a recovery with a growth in the range of 4 to 5 percent. So overall, that's where you're coming from. Now, the question is, how do we generate the growth even going forward? Because in 2021, we are we are passing a recovery of between 4 to 5, and uh, in, uh, in the outer year, we are talking about a growth of 67 percent. So the question is, how do you get the uh, year the economy growing back? On the assumption that, yes, COVID is still with us until 2022, uh, whether we get the vaccine, by the time it comes to uh, Uganda, probably it will be in, in 2021 and 2022. So the assumption is that we have is that COVID is still with us. And so social distancing measures and some of the sectors impacted will still be constrained until 2022. So the question is, how do we uh, stimulate growth? As the, as the central bank, we tried to ease the repeated condition. Remember, we reduced the uh, monetary policy rate from 9 to 7 to be able really uh, to collect the cycle, the process, uh, cyclical cycle, the cyclicality of private sector policy expenses. So uh, the question was whether now by reducing the policy rate and putting on the PDK support measures uh, uh, you know, by Bank of Uganda, whether that can stimulate banks uh, to do the lending to the private sector. Remember, the private sector is equally constrained. So we have seen that after the private sector uh, banks rather are really risk averse. They are not willing to lend to private sector, which is a big uh, constraint. This automatically means that monetary transmission mechanism are really weakened. So in the face of monetary policy make a transition mechanism, the only fallback uh, is government. So we have seen that the government is coming on, increase this expenditure, with the fiscal deficit for this financial year, which is 2021, rising to 10.4% 10, 10 of the GDP. Now, someone will remember that in the, uh, sometime back in the in the June, we we read the, the, uh, the, the budget for the financial year, and I think it had the numbers in Korea, uh, talking about fiscal deficit and domestic borrowing, which was a, domestic borrowing was about to, uh, 3% of GDP. But with the new fiscal numbers, this kind of stimulate growth, we are talking about uh, higher domestic financing, which means government has to issue more bonds uh, to the market. We are to finance the expenditure. However, the caveat is whether we go in the first quarter of 2021 smoothly. Normally, when we have uh, 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 when we have election, people become risk averse, uh, and therefore you will see a lot of some bit of depreciation pressures in the in the quarter towards the uh, the election. But so far, because the election are in February 2021. Uh, so we think that this time around, probably, given the uh, these certain distance, uh, the metals and also lockdown, we cannot have significant depreciation pressure. On interest rate, as I said, with the increase in the public uh, public borrowing, we believe that probably yields could go up because I think we are talking about uh, 
a substantial increase in domestic borrowing, which would warrant really high increase in yield for them to be attractive. So we are talking about, at the, in, the, in April and May, we are, we are talking about Uganda shilling about 3 trillion increase in domestic borrowing. Now we are talking about double. Double that would mean uh, a, a, a slightly substantial increase in terms of auction amounts, and that would attract the idea uh, slightly higher yield. But so far, I think uh, basically that's what I can add on in terms of uh, what we are uh, saying. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Mugume, for that um, insight and uh, giving us further context on the on the Uganda's um, economy. Dr. Moremi, when we look at it now from a, um, a capital markets perspective, um, are you in a position to advise on what the impact, you know, of COVID has been, and really what? the uh, capital market is doing to drive uh, growth into into 2021 tanzania in relation to um covid 19 has its own um, experience which is different from other uh, countries in the region on the economic front there were some few sectors that were also impacted and um trade um tourism uh, uh transport uh, those those were the sectors that were really impacted during that period, and even now they are trying to recover. The GDP estimation was um, reduced from the initial 6.9 percent to 5.5 percent, um, which relatively it's still a good growth, um, given the fact that some other economies, even within um, Africa and the region. They expect to grow negatively and some at the levels which are relatively less than the 5.5% which uh, we anticipate as a country. Now, as it relates to the, the capital market space, um, a significant part of our uh, liquidity, um, what supports our volatility, but also valuation of listed securities, especially on the equity segment, um, somehow depends on the um, foreign investors. So fund managers from Europe, from the US, um, do contribute uh, significantly to the liquidity um, uh, creation, uh, price formation in our market, but also uh, issues of price volatility. So the pressure that we are seeing um, coming from the fact that foreign investments has been declined significantly, then that impacts also um, on the liquidity, volatility, and valuation of our uh, equity listed securities. In terms of indices and market cap, um, the total market cap, we are down by almost 16% um, this year. But if you take um, our domestic indices and domestic market cap, we are up by 0.5%. So as I said, um, from the local market perspective, the impact hasn't been as significant, but as it relates to other um, nations, then we, we really um, can see the, the, the impact. Now, the good thing is that on the fixed in income segment of the market, there has been a very significant um, increase in terms of liquidity, but also um, in terms of um, pricing. So in almost all um, tenors of uh, bonds, uh, they are almost trading um, on premiums, uh, which, which is not the experience that we have ever had um, in the almost 20 years of an exchange in Tanzania. And also liquidity has increased significantly. Last year, the whole year we traded equivalent to $400 million um, of bonds, which is um, one trillion Tanzanian shillings. But year to date this year, we are at the levels of 1.75 um, trillion. So that is almost an increase of 75% relative to, to last year. So that, that is a significant um, increase on that aspect. And so two, two elements in my, in my um, evaluation. Number one, um, 
the, the government appetite to borrow because of the infrastructure projects in which they are, they put a lot of emphasis. Um, some of the funds has to be um, generated from borrowings. And um, it seems like the market is, has a lot of confidence with the government and hence their willingness to, you know, lend the gov to the government even if they, they um, do that at, at some um, premiums. Second, uh, lending to private sector by commercial banks has been impacted, especially on the sectors which I mentioned earlier. Lending to those sectors right now is uh, risky to um, banks. And so banks seems to be having this liquidity in which they are, you know, packing it in the government securities. So that's where we, we are um, in terms of the impact of COVID-19 as it relates to the um, capital market space in Tanzania. What are your aspirations, you know, as a CEO of, of the stock exchange? Um, and what are some of the um, transformational ideas, you know, that you have uh, lined up for for the capital markets, um, and we are cognizant of the fact that you know foreign foreign investors really continue playing a key role in the um, capital markets activities within the region, um, and they still continue to be a key contributor to to our capital markets. Um, in response to the foreign investors, what are some of the uh, plans that you have? you know, to continue uh, deepening your capital markets? Uh, should we see uh, new products coming in in the near future? Uh, if you could just give us uh, your final comments and overview uh, from that perspective. Um, thank you, Janet. So in terms of our, our anticipation, which is enshrined, enshrined into the the um, five-year strategic plan in which we are implementing um, is that we envisage to be able to, um, you know, to influence the policy side of the capital market so that policymakers um, from the policy perspective, but also the legislative uh, perspective, to consider the capital market as one of the key or fundamental um, sources of financing economic development. So in line with that, um, just uh, some few weeks ago, the, um, the government uh, launched the uh, financial market master plan, um, which is, is a broader document, which includes on how the government sees the capital market and how the vibrance of the local capital market is fundamental to the um to the intended economic development so so that that's that's something which we we have been able to achieve and the fact that from the police perspective um uh, the capital market is is seen as one of the uh instruments to enable the kind of economic growth that we as a nation we see ourselves um uh achieving then that that's 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 something which is uh significant to us. And, and also we see the kind of growth that we have been experiencing as a nation, which has been on the average of 70% uh, for almost three decades. Then that kind of um, GDP growth is very attractive for, you know, um, investors uh, and especially FDIs as well as portfolio investors. And we as the market, uh, we align ourselves with that by making sure that our legal and regulatory framework, but also the techni technological infrastructure um, will be able to attract both retail, um, institutional, uh, local and um, foreign investors participating in our, in our market. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mugume. It seems like there is quite a, a bit of uh, work for you to do between now and, uh, and QR 2021. And I truly wish you all the best. As Stanbic Bank, you know, we remain committed to partnering with our regulators to really see how we deepen our, our, our financial and capital markets. So thank you so much for, for those insights. Thank you, Hilda, Jero, for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, we've had discussions from our partners um, in the region. And really, we, were, we are looking at 2020. We are reflecting on 2020. 
what 2020 has dealt us and really uh, some of the plans that we started with at the beginning of the year and what has how that has been impacted and the response um, that as a CSD you've taken to, to ensure that we continue providing that confidence to our investors that we are still in the settlement and clearing business and we are still able to support them in, um, in, in the clearing and settlement of their transactions in our capital market. Thank you, Janet. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And thank you very much, our participants, for joining us in this conversation. At CTSC, we have just shifted to a new system, very robust, very vibrant. So for us, it was it was just uh, that we had done sort of the, the preparation ahead of, of the pandemic. So that when the pandemic came, it found us in a very secure and a very robust platform. So for us, um, with a new CSD platform, it, it made reaching our clients a lot easier. It made the clearing and settlement a lot easier. Like everybody else, we've had to implement a raft of measures to cater now for uh, working away from the office. But I think uh, we, we do celebrate that we have not missed any clearing or settlement of our transactions from the Securities Exchange, not even a single day. So for us as, as a CSD and as a, as a financial intermediary, everything uh, seems to be uh, on course, save for that uh, 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 act of God, as, as we call it, uh, because uh, I think this was unprecedented. Nobody had uh, had, um, even the, the financial experts, even the economists, nobody had foreseen or even prepared for this. So, so Janet, I think uh, that in a nutshell is where CDSC finds it, uh, herself in today. Would investors then be looking at the CSD as being the, the, the central counterparty, the CCP, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, really guaranteeing an investor as a lender that at the end of the contract, uh, you know, one will get their securities back? As we are all aware, I think, Terminology in the capital market space is, is a very kind of um, emotive issue. And we are especially careful not to use the terminology CCP or central counterparts. But the long and short of it is that indeed CSD is, is uh, right in the middle of all these conversations, uh, of all these transactions. I mean, uh, CDSC is offering the, the assurance and the guarantee that for the lenders of the securities, you will get back your securities at the end of the, of the contract duration. It's offering the, the borrowers the assurance that once you come on board, the, the borrowing or the lending request that you fight are, 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 are genuine, they are legit, you will get your securities as per um, your request. Uh, we are also offering the, the assurance that for the lenders, you will get your, your lending fee or which is now the income from this transaction uh, as and when now the, uh, the transaction is concluded. We are also offering the assurance that um, for the lenders especially, you, are, you, are, you will get back your securities when the contract expires. And how do we guarantee that? We have made sure that uh, the borrowers provide 100% um, plus 10 margin on the value of, of the of the of the borrowed come lent securities. So uh, we, we have put in place quite a raft of mitigation measures just to, to guarantee both lenders and borrowers um, that indeed this the transactions will be um, effected in a very secure and safe manner. And what we have now told the, the market is that there's so much you can do once you borrow the securities. If you have a contract for 90 days and you need to fulfill maybe a short position, you don't have to return the securities immediately. You, you fulfill your short position. You can do multiple transactions with, with, those, with those securities. So we are saying it's, it's, it's a platform for bringing a lot of velocity and vibrancy and liquidity into the, into the, into the capital market. What else should investors look out for um, into, into the other quarters of, of, of 2021 and possibly into 2020, uh, 2022? So uh, we are in very exciting times, Janet. Uh, our new CSD has capabilities to support so many other kinds of investment products. Uh, 
And I mean, even just from an investor care and uh, service point of view, uh, soon investors will be able to open uh, CSD accounts online from the comfort of your home all through. And so that in itself is also something that uh, and the, the market and uh, I mean, uh, our capital market in Kenya has been looking forward to. We are also putting together an API connectivity so that then uh, there they will be again straight through. And so I think for us, the, the big word uh, at CDSC uh, for, for the next uh, couple of years is, is just a uh, eliminating inefficiencies as just and just introducing as many channels as possible for for straight through processing be it from the from the participants be it from the foreign investors be it from even from local investors um mobile phone uh, connectivity penetration in kenya is is is, is very big it's very it's very uh, connected and so uh we we will be having a very enhanced uh web connectivity, app connectivity, you can do your transactions virtually from anywhere across the world. So for us, uh, what we are we are focusing on for the next couple of years is just um, making everything as smooth as possible. We will bring on board the API, the SLB, uh, um, uh, I know there are conversations around day trading, even that in itself is, is, is also going to be a big thing once the securities exchange is able to roll that out. Um, I should point out that our CSD system is is ready. I just I think as we are just waiting for the for the bell ringing, uh, it will just be a plug and play for us. So for us, we are we are we are really looking forward to improved um, efficiencies. So thank you so much uh, to my panelists. Uh, this afternoon, um, we've heard about what we expect uh, into 2021 from an economic perspective, uh, where we see our GDP growth uh, projections into, into 2021, um, inflation, interest rates, and currency. Um, and thank you so much, Kuria, for giving us those insights. I believe that you know we continue with the conversations um, as we get into Q1 2021 to just get to see whether you know, those fundamentals still hold and what changes. So that then from an investor perspective, we are able to, um, to take the information and actually use it to the benefit of our, uh, our, institutional, our institutional investors. Um, to Dr. Mugume, as I said, uh, it looks, you know, uh, Q4 into Q, uh, Q1 2021, you, you have quite a lot um, on your plate, you know, looking to see how you improve or enhance the uh, financial market space, more so in as far as uh, our in clients or investors' participation in the government issuances, uh, you know, looking to create efficiencies from a trading perspective, looking to see how you, you know, continue providing more opportunities from an investor perspective, you know, to participate more in, in government issuances, um, and also looking to see how you can um provide more value uh by you know reducing withholding tax of course you know based on the discussions and the outcome um from from the ministry ministry of finance and also you know look for the for the investors to look forward to uh perhaps you know having new products in as far as infrastructure bonds are concerned or or euro bonds so we really thank you um for for those insights to mr moremi um Really thanking you, you know, for giving us insight in terms of the the plans that Tanzania Capital Markets has, um, you know, in improving the participation, be it by the retail investors, and also looking to see how you continue to improve, you know, continue to uh, provide efficiencies in your market, and also um, looking at the the developmental plan and the financial market sector master plan and what that has in store for for our investors. I believe, you know, this is something that's exciting. This is something that um, our investors, our clients will be looking to get to know more about and for them to see how they are able to use that information, you know, for purposes of continuously um, uh, participating more in the, in the, in the Tanzania uh, capital market. So thank you so much for your time.